Hello, and welcome to SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. Thank you to our viewers from around the world for joining us. Please let us know where you are watching from. And also, welcome into listeners on the podcast version of SETI Live, which is available on most podcast platforms. Today, I am joined by Megan Grace Lee, a PhD student at UCLA uh, in the UCLA SETI department. She recently conducted research that uh, helps us constrain signal drift for searching for techno signatures. I'm going to let her talk about that. So uh, welcome in, Megan. Thank you for being here. Um, what is this paper about? Will you kind of give us like the, the elevator pitch version? Yeah, so hi, as Beth mentioned, my name's Megan and I am a second year PhD student at UCLA where I work on SETI. Uh, two years ago, I had the privilege of being an intern with the Breakthrough Listen project, which is heavily affiliated with the SETI Institute. And while I was there, I constrained how signals that are sent to us from exoplanets may be a little bit shifted or drifted once they get to Earth. So. Um, if you've ever walked past an ambulance and noticed that the siren is changing pitch as it moves past you, that is the same phenomenon that I am looking at with possible radio techno signatures from other exoplanets. So if somebody on an exoplanet was sending us a radio signal of constant frequency, by the time it gets here, that frequency is going to have some modulation due to the orbit of the exoplanet and our orbit and their star and so on. So what what's the basis for this? What's the thing that needed to be figured out? What were you trying to understand? Yes. So we have to check every single variation of a possible modulation of a techno signature to really make sure that we've searched for every techno signature possible. We don't want to accidentally miss a signal because it had too much Doppler shift by the time it got to us. So we want to check as wide of a window as possible. Uh, in 2019, my mentor, Dr. Sophia Sheikh, who currently is now a postdoc at the SETI Institute, um, tried to imagine the craziest signal possible. So in her paper, she takes a really crazy planet with a very eccentric and very fast orbit and decided that the craziest exoplanet could produce a Doppler drift of 200 nanohertz. Um, so that would mean that every second, the... Um, sorry, there's like a slope of frequency over time and then every second this signal would shift 200 nanohertz which is a really really big shift uh so people would have to check everything from zero to 200 nanohertz in pitch modulation in order to encompass the signals that dr shake was mentioning however this is really really costly in computational costs and we mm -hmm. estimate that the number of modulations or drift rates that you would have to check um, is sort of linear in cost so checking 200 uh, different drift rates versus checking 40 different drift rates, like my paper has decided, um, your cost is going to go down by an order of four times. Um, so our goal was to try to figure out uh, how we could encompass just 99% of signals from exoplanets so that we wouldn't have to use all 200 and we could find some smaller number that would be a happy medium at 99%. And luckily for us, like I mentioned, that number ended up being just 40 that's that's a huge change, obviously. And you did this using the um, exoplanet uh, NASA's exoplanet archive. And you know, we've gone from you know a handful of planets to well over five thousand um, and and constantly increasing. So what did you use this catalog for? What was the purpose of of using the catalog? How did that help you establish this new sort of baseline? Yeah, so I had a really good time using this catalog. When I first started the project in the summer of 2021, we were at only about 4,500 uh, discovered exoplanets. And then by the time I published it in this year, we were at like 5,400. So that was like, um, you know, my results were constantly changing every time TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Sky Survey, had a data dump. All of my numbers would change again. So I think like, I've really built a solid friendship with the NASA Exoplanet Archive of understanding uh, the new types of planets that are constantly uploaded to it. Um, as far as the paper goes, Sophia's paper from 2019 just thought of the hypothetical craziest exoplanet that could ever physically exist. Um, whereas mine was saying, out of the exoplanets that we already know about, how can we uh, encompass 99% of the signals that may come from those exoplanets? So half of my paper uses exoplanets that we know about um, from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, and the other half uses the simulated population of exoplanets that we built using our current knowledge of exoplanet science. Uh, because observable 
observable exoplanets have some inherent biases and reasons why we're able to see them. The number one reason is that the planet is transiting, uh, meaning that if this is the star, the planet is passing in front of the star. Uh, But there's nothing that would encourage exoplanets to do that. Um, Exoplanets could pass like this, and that would make them more difficult for us to see. Right, because so so the Doppler shift is because it's moving toward you and away from you. But if you're looking at a planet that's face on on its orbit, it's not going to do that. You're going to see it in the same position. So you're not going to get any drift rate from that particular planet. Yeah, that's exactly correct. But it's just okay. so hard for our telescopes to even see the planets that are zero Doppler drift. Uh, because right now we've been using uh, the transit method, which is when the planet passes in front of the star, the star's luminosity decreases and then it goes back up. And then we get some periodic decrease in luminosity. And that's like, oh, it's a planet. Um, but it's really hard for us to see the other ones without some other form like direct imaging that we're working on. Okay, so you need like a you need a planet that has at least some sort of tilt to it so that we can we can see it with that that Doppler shift happening. Um, how does does anything you know? It, it obviously this matters to like the position that Earth is in. So does it help at all that we're like moving towards and away that from it at all, or is it just too much of a not enough of a dif- a difference to really show in the data? Yeah, so. Earth's drift rate is a quantifiable number, and it's sort of the same all the time. How much the Earth is rotating around the sun and how much the Earth is spinning, um, that is sort of not going to change on an order of magnitude. Uh, So we just sort of add that Doppler drift into our searches naturally. And then my job was to add the Earth's Doppler shift plus the exoplanet's Doppler drift. Um, And then with the massive amount of unconstrained exoplanets, we had to have some kind of estimate. So my job was sort of estimating well, if we have some, you know, tens of thousands of exoplanets that maybe we've discovered or haven't discovered, how can we make sure that we are encompassing 99% of the signals that may come from those exoplanets? Okay. And so you you did a, so you went from using um, actual exoplanets to a simulation. Um, what did that simulation entail? Um, can you get a little bit more into like what you, what you, what you did? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, so um, out of the exoplanets that are currently in the NASA Exoplanet Archive, 80% of them or so, when I last checked, are the ones that are passing in front of their star. Um, so we're arguing that there's sort of a random geometry of planetary orbits. Some of them will be like the transiting ones, some of them will be these face on ones we were talking about earlier, and then there's sort of everything in between. Uh, but the NASA Exoplanet Archive is not going to have the ones that are like this or that are mm-hmm. everywhere in between because our telescopes haven't been able to find them. So right. Sophia and I decided to simulate the rest of those planets that would not already be in the NASA Exoplanet Archive. And so after we simulated all of those planets, they had all different kinds of orbits, ones we could detect, ones we couldn't detect. Um, we could actually encompass 99% of the signals from those potential exoplanets with just 0.44 nanohertz, which is like two orders of magnitude or three smaller than um, Sophia's original 200. So at that point, if someday SETI searches could check every single exoplanet that we can see or we cannot see, our computation efforts for checking those would go down like you know 10 to the three. I'm I'm still fascinated by this idea of exoplanets that we can't see because you know it, it makes absolute sense. Yes, we're only seeing a small portion based on our observation biases, but it just I I'm I'm sort of just I'm still wrapping my head around being able to lo- sort of like get a signal from a planet we don't even know is there. So <clears throat> how so computationally this will decrease the the effort that we have to do but what is what is the impact on where we should be looking can we is is this sort of more of a we can just look at the whole sky or do we still need to sort of do a targeted search with this yeah that's a really great question so Um, There's sort of like a couple of different ways that people go about this, and I think you did happen to touch on both of them. There's one option where we purposely point our telescope at an exoplanet that we know exists. And we do that usually by selecting the star as the target. Um, And so the star is taking up some amount of space on your telescope, but with radio astronomy, we can get everything that's behind the star as well. 
So really your observation um, when you're pointing your telescope at just one star is this huge cone of all this space volume behind your star as well. So that's gonna include some exoplanets we can see, some that we can't, stars that maybe uh, were blocked by the original star. And so every time we point a telescope, there are theoretically exoplanets in there that we cannot see. And that's why there's sort of these two different methods of we're going to either point them at specific exoplanet targets or we're just gonna sort of scan a certain patch of sky knowing that there's gonna be exoplanets in that patch. And so your method sort of uh, aims at that latter, like your calculations aim at that latter method of just sort of like, we're just gonna look for something because you know we know there's a bias and we can, we can look at a planet and we, we can calculate that pretty easily, but it's the ones we can't see that we're more interested in sort of like finding a signal from using your uh, your simulation and your calculations, correct? Yeah, exactly. So I think the implications of my work are sort of twofold. Um, number one, in the computational cost ac aspect that I mentioned earlier, in which searching a smaller window of drift rates is spending a lot less money on computing resources. But also on the other hand of like post detection protocol, if somebody were to find a narrow band radio techno signature, we could sort of like think backwards and look at the drift rate and then try to figure out if there is an exoplanet in that area that's going to match that drift rate. Okay, so this comes back This comes back to the, the protocols, which um, for those of you unfamiliar, basically if we find something, you have to confirm it with other ob observations. It can't just be like, I found a signal. It has to be like, I think I found a signal. Can you go take a look and see if you see it? So here what you're saying is we found a signal. We don't know what it's from. We don't we we don't know of an exoplanet in that area. Can you go take an observation? And here's what we think the drift rate is. And, and then it can be used as sort of like another layer on top of what to observe for. Yeah, exactly. Um, so normally, if we get drift rates that are too close to um, no drift at all, we assume that that is coming from Earth because they're drifting with us. So we would get a relative acceleration of zero. Um, and then on the other hand, let's say somebody does happen to see a narrowband signal that is drifting you know, really, really heavily, like um, something like 300 nanohertz per second or something like that, we might be like, we don't really think an exoplanet can move that quickly. Like, is there another issue? And look deeper into <laughs> some other concepts that may be at play. So you still you still get some nice constraints on what co would constitute a potential signal and what would be, eh, we don't think so. Let's Let's look for a different answer. Yeah, exactly. So I guess that work started with Sophia in 2019, where she put 200 nanohertz. But again, that's the craziest exoplanet anybody could ever imagine. And now uh, we believe we're looking more at 45 with exoplanets that we know about and like 0.45 with exoplanets we don't know about. That is that is a significant drop. <laughs> yes, definitely. So this is so so. Um... How, I want to talk to you about you. Um, how did you get involved in this research? What led you into working on, on SETI work? Yeah, so I was first introduced to the concept of SETI when I was a freshman at UC San Diego. I was taking a freshman seminar called Thinking Like a Physicist. And the concept of this class was that every day you would try to stump the professor by asking the craziest question imaginable. So naturally, week one, somebody's like, are there aliens? Can you prove it? And he was like, oh, did you know, like, there's actually a field called SETI? And I was just like, totally enamored. Um, on day one of college. So from then I kept trying to get into SETI, but SETI opportunities are sort of like sparse and far between. Um, mm -hmm. The most popular one that I know about is the Breakthrough Listen REU uh, research experience for undergraduates summer internship that takes about 12 students every year. Uh, but that's not very many as, you know, compared to the whole body of astrophysicists. Um, and looking for SETI positions continues to be mildly difficult. I got very, very lucky in the one that I am currently at at UCLA. Uh, Los Angeles is my hometown and I always wanted to live here. And I saw that there was an open position at UCLA to do SETI by way of AI and citizen science. And I was like, this spot was made for me. I love outreach. I'm really interested in getting into more of the computer science stuff. And I really don't want to leave LA. So I'm extremely fortunate to have gotten into this spot, but I've sort of just always wanted to be here. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Um, so I totally understand the struggle is real. Um, getting internships in, in physics and astronomy, no matter what your, your specialization is always, um, it's always a, a task. Um, SETI, of course, being even more difficult because there's so little 
uh, government grant funding available. So there's not, it's not an expanding, it's, it's starting to be an expanding field. So you're working on your PhD, your second, you said second year PhD candidate? Yeah, second year. And I'm not going to ask you about your thesis. I don't want to do that to any graduate student. But do you have an idea of what you would like to do once you are finished with your PhD? Um, once I'm finished with my PhD, I would love to somehow stay in SETI. I will say that uh, I'm trying to remain hopeful, but also open to other opportunities. I did purposefully select a PhD position that would give me other marketable skills, which is something I know a lot of other SETI scientists sort of like have to do right now. Um, so my PhD thesis is actually going to, it's already sort of decided, and it's about using uh, machine learning to get radio frequency interference out of our telescope. So, you know, um, if you're scanning the sky for radio signals, most of the radio signals that you pick up are signals from Earth. And mm -hmm. this can be really like pesky to get out of your search because you only want signals from space. And so as our sky is becoming more populated with things like GPS satellites, it's harder and harder to not accidentally only scan radio frequency interference from these satellites. And so I'm sort of working on a way to get rid of these signals before we even have to look at them so that in the future, other SETI scientists can just start looking only at radio signals from space. So you're basically, uh, you're, you're hardcore getting into the programming side of, of SETI then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I didn't really realize that astrophysics had a programming aspect until it was already like too late. I think I was a sophomore in college and I realized <laughs> that everybody knew how to code and you have to know how to code to be an astrophysicist. And I was very, very lost. But there was a very kind professor at UC San Diego named Karen Sandstrom who took me under her wing and she goes, you know, Megan, I don't know Python. You don't know Python. Let's learn Python together. And that was crazy. I did not understand how lucky I was at the time that that happened, but I'm so eternally grateful that she was like totally okay with me starting programming from ground zero. Even downloading Python onto my computer took me like 10 hours. And that was my very humble beginning. And now I'm still in the learning process. I don't think any programmer is ever really out of the learning process. Um, and especially as you venture into uh, machine learning, because of course now you're you're teaching machines to do things for you. So um, how, have you started on this? Do you, do you have like a, a path forward in, in this doctorate work? Yeah, so I've already sort of built a rudimentary image classifier to identify the most common forms of uh, radio frequency interference that ground-based US telescopes are going to see. So a lot of these are like the GPS signals that we use every single day. And so mm -hmm. I'm pretty good at having my image classifier identify the top three most common forms of radio signals, but there's something like 25 or 30 that I'm still working on. Um, so these preliminary results, I actually got to present them at Penn State last summer at the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Conference, which mm -hmm. is from what I am aware of, our only SETI conference ever, which is really, really cool. Um, and so people there were really, really excited about the work. And I'm hoping to be able to someday share my image classifier with all forms of radio astronomers so that we can all finally be rid of GPS. <laughs> Will it take care of uh, the, uh, the satellites from some of the bigger satellite constellations as well? Yes. So we definitely can see the streaks from Starlink. I remember when I was an intern at Breakthrough Listen, um, Steve Croft from Breakthrough and SETI was telling me about that. And he would just like live observe the sky for us and be like, look, there's Starlink again. We can see it. Um, so it's sort of a reverse engineering process because humans put all of this stuff up there and now the other humans are like, we have to somehow subtract it back out of the data. Um, but definitely, I think by the time I finish my PhD thesis, my image classifier is gonna be really, really good at getting rid of all of the major forms of interference. That will be fantastic. I definitely look forward to that. I'm, I'm gonna welcome in some viewers um, and uh, and also say that if you have questions for, for Megan about uh, searching for techno signatures, uh, please put them in the comments and, and we will get through them. I would like to welcome in people from New Jersey, France, Florida, Louisiana. Hello, Ron. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, London, England, also uh, elsewhere in the United Kingdom, Wisconsin, Maryland, uh, Moose Jaw, Canada. Wow. Welcome in. Um, more UK. I saw Michigan, Brazil, and Portugal, Australia. Thank you so much. And, um, and, and Caleb is in Los Angeles. So someone else is, is here for, from where you are. 
Uh, I do want to answer a quick question from Rob. Um, completely irrelevant of anything, but Rob uh, Harrison is asking, and this is just for me, hoping to see the Northern Lights here tonight. Do I have a chance of seeing them? If you are in Northern Wisconsin, I am going to say yes, but there are, uh, if you go to, I think it's spaceweather.com um, or spaceweather.org. If you go look there, they will, they will have forecasts to tell you how to see and where you might be able to see the Aurora. Uh, my understanding is that we had a very big uh, solar flare CME today. So um, if you are at near near the poles than, than I am, let me tell you, uh, please go outside and, and try to get a look tonight. Um, also have some people coming in from Quebec and Mexico. So uh, welcome in. All right. So far, I have one question. I'm not sure that we can personally answer this, but I'm going to ask it. Trev asks, would any of the instruments still working on Voyager probes be able to pick up any signals from outside our solar system from exoplanets? Okay, so I'm not an expert on Voyager, but most of our ground-based telescopes, if not all of them, are very, very good at picking up these signals from other exoplanets. So we can expect that things like Green Bank are looking at everything, again, in that observable cone and not just the singular uh, point source that they decided to target. So definitely, uh, we are very, very good at picking up signals from planets outside of our solar system, the exoplanets. Yeah, I think, I don't know is uh, there's anything aboard Voyager at this point that that could that we could use for that. I think right now we are down to some bare minimums for what the instrumentation is allowed to do um, simply because, you know, we, it's getting very far away. We can't send a lot of things. The programming of course is also, um, you know, it's, it's 40 plus year old programming. And as I said, programmers never stop learning. And so we've kind of gone beyond that. And there's a lot of people trying to deal with the legacy software from these, these older spacecraft. Uh, so I don't know that even if we did, even if it heard something that we would be able to do anything with that information. So um, there's a lot of, a lot of moving pieces in there that I don't think would help. Um, Caleb is asking, and everybody asked this question. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it of you. Um, how can people get involved in helping with SETI research? Is there anything that the public can do to help? Absolutely. So I would encourage everybody to go to arewealone.earth right now. You can do that while I'm talking. And this is the citizen science project that is directly linked to my PhD research. So as I mentioned, I am using machine learning to filter out forms of radio frequency interference. And my computer code is going to need something to learn um, how to filter these out by. So if you go to arewealone.earth, you can help me by classifying different radio frequency interference signals into the different types of satellites that they're actually coming from. Yeah, so this is our project. It's up on Zooniverse. It's pretty simple to use, so we think any of us should use it, so you should bring it to all of your kids' birthday parties from now on. Um, and eventually, all of your answers will become the label training set that I will use for my PhD research. So I'm hoping that the beginning of my thesis has like a QR code with the screen names of everybody who volunteered. And big sincere thank you to each and every person who has already classified signals for me. That is fantastic. I am so happy. You will make a lot of people very excited to see that there is actually a citizen science aspect to this. So I'm I'm so glad I asked you the question. And Caleb, if if you set that up for her as a as a softball, it's okay. I love it. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, we've kind of reached the half the end of our half hour, and I don't have any other questions. So I want to thank Megan for being here for talking about her research, both the press release that came out and what she's working on for her doctorate. We definitely want to have you back to talk more about that as it progresses. So um, next time you have something to present, please, please, please let us know and we will have you back on. Um, everybody, you know, go take a look, jump in on that citizen science. That is fantastic. I'm very excited. That was the first I had heard of it. So I'm going to go take a look and I'm going to go play with it as well. And uh, as always, thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Megan, for being here. And um, we will see you probably not next week, um, but possibly the week after that. The holidays are, are getting here and schedules are getting a little dodgy for everybody. So uh, hang in there. We'll announce our next study live as soon as we have it available. Once again, thank you everybody for being here. Have a fabulous rest of your week and thank you, Megan. <laughs>